Okay. And so here is the idea. This is illustrated with ammonia and and 13 ammonia is a perfusion tracer, which means that the bottleneck for accumulation is perfusion rather than the, the metabolism of the cells. So yeah, it, it ends up in the mitochondria. And so here you see uh, the image after 20 second, three minute, uh, 40 second, three minutes and 20 minutes. And so again, yeah, this is the left ventricle. So this is the, the left ventricular cavity and here is the right. Uh, ventricular cavity, and then the atria are on top of here. And this green line tells where this image is taken on the other way around. And so you see 20 seconds after injection, the blood is accumulating in the blood pool of the right ventricle. And then from there, it goes to the lungs, and then it comes back and ends in the, comes in the left ventricle. And then from there, it goes to the entire body, also to the heart. So there is a yeah, a few arteries that immediately uh, come from the heart and go to the heart, and then the ammonia starts accumulating in the, um, in the, in the muscle. And so it gets trapped and the washout is very slow. So after 20 minutes, a lot of activity has been accumulated. And typically that's what we like uh, for tracers, same for LPG, it accumulates in proportion to something interesting. So if you wait long enough, you get an excellent image because a lot of activity accumulated in the interesting part of the body. And in addition, it provides you metabolic information because that accumulation is affected by um, a, a feature of interest, which in this, in this case is perfusion. So if the, if the patient would have a, an infarction, then there would be a black spot here because that infarction would not accumulate ammonia. So usually they just, the, the medical doctors just use these images because they already tell where the infarcts are. So a lot of diagnosis can be made here. But you can, in some cases, it's mandatory or, or very useful to quantify the flow. And not only to see that it is uniform, but also to have an idea about how high that flow is, if it's much higher or much lower than the normal flow. And that you can derive by uh, studying this, this uh, dynamic behavior. And here is a similar, but now this is for carbon 11 acetate. So this, this image is more recent and you, one way to see it's more recent is that you have a better outline of the right ventricle. And that's because modern PET scanners have a better resolution. And carbon 11 acetate is, is different. It's uh, the uptake in the beginning. So from here, now it starts accumulating and that is uh, mostly affected by perfusion, but then it washes out again. And that is because that acetate is being burned by the heart and the carbon 11 ends up in uh, carbon dioxide and leaves via the blood. And so that's why it washes out again. So if you do kinetic modeling on this, then you can get both the perfusion and the oxidative metabolism in, in each of these, uh, in, in every voxel piece. Okay, so here is the idea. <clears throat> and so the, the basic idea is that you can describe the behavior of uh, a particular tissue of interest with a tracer kinetic model. And so it looks like this. So this, this thing represents uh, yeah, just a small piece of tissue. And the model says that there will be um, a tracer concentration in the blood. And then there are kinetic constant, which is this K1, K2, K3, and K4. And they tell how much activity per unit uh, time is transferred along that arrow here. And so the, there are three small Ks and one big K. And that is because this big K is slightly different. It, it goes from the blood here. So the, the unit of that K is slightly different. So you have to multiply this K with the blood concentrate with the tracer concentration in the blood to obtain the amount of tracer that is being transferred here. For the other um, case, they just give the fraction of the amount of activity that is here that is transferred along that arrow. So to know how much activity is ending up following this arrow, I simply have to multiply the concentration here with that K. All right. And then if you ask the biologist, 
to draw these compartmental models. Then after careful study of the tissue, they will come up with, with uh, drawings that contain maybe 20 or 30 of these compartments. And they all have to be connected with little keys. And then we get a huge amount of parameters. There's no way we can estimate all these parameters from uh, a simple PET study. And the reason for that is that this is basically what we can measure. So we can inject the tracer. And if it's about the heart, we can draw a region here or in the aorta, which would be here. And then plot the concentration uh, of the tracer in that region as a function of time. And that tells us how much tracer is being supplied as a function of time to that tissue here. And then we can draw a region here, and then we find what the tissue is doing with this. And so th this region is a combination of these two. And uh, very often, this would represent the extravascular compartment, meaning that the tracer is leaving the blood and uh, yeah, is, is offered to the tissues. <coughs> and then K3 tells what uh, the cells are doing with it. So for, for um, FDG, for example, K3 would mean that the tracer is taken up, is, is going through the wall of the cell and then gets uh, phosphorylated and then is trapped inside the cell. And so all we have is this, and you can see the PET frames are this, I hope you see the little crosses here. That's just all the data we have. So we have like 20 frames, and that's definitely not enough to determine 50 uh, K values. So what people always do is simplify these tracer kinetic models as much as possible, such that some meaningful, uh, yeah, they, they keep some metabolic interest, and otherwise they're as simple as possible. And very often that ends up with just two uh, what they call tissue compartments. So we have a blood compartment and then two tissue compartments and four K values connecting them. And then very often K4 for many traces can be set to zero because the traces are designed to accumulate. So they typically don't leave that compartment very quickly. Now this is to emphasize that, that blood is a very big pool and that if you study a little region here, you have to consider the blood as uh, given data. And what happens here is not influenced by what happens in these two compartments. So I've, I've found that if I ask students to do some calculations that very often they say, okay, the, the change of this compartment is what comes in minus what comes out and same here, which is correct. And then they also do that here and they say, well, this, the concentration here will decrease a bit because some tracer is going here. And then it will also increase a bit because some tracer goes here. This drawing is to say that that is incorrect because we study just a very small region here. And the effect of that small region on, on that big pool of blood is negligible. There is an effect, of course, that of all these compartments together. And so this compartment cannot tell us what the other ones are doing. So we cannot compute this, we have to measure it. Okay, so this is measured, the whole thing is measured, and just we determine the values of the key. All right, <clears throat> so here is for um, glucose so, and deoxyglucose, but here the, the important issue is that FDG is not glucose, it is deoxyglucose, which is chemically different. It's actually flu fluoral deoxyglucose. And so the cells, they notice the difference between these two molecules. So we have to study uh, what happens to both of the molecules. And the situation for the two molecules is very different because we assume that for glucose, everything is stable. So the glucose concentration in the blood should be constant during the scan. And then we also assume that the tissues are not changing, that these Ks are constant and that they have been constant for a long time such that everything is, is, uh, is steady state. So that means there is no change of the uh, glucose concentration in the blood and also no change in this, uh, in this compartment. So that means that what comes in in this compartment equals what goes out. So that is written here, the change per unit of time equals zero. And that change is this concentration times this K value plus uh, this constant or minus this concentration times this K with what is going back to the blood and also minus this concentration times K3, which is what goes to the final compartment. 
den Verlugos ähm, well, uh, it says K4 is zero, it's a bit subtle. For what happens to glucose is that, that glucose is metabolized. So glucose is coming in here and then it is metabolized. So the, the concentration of glucose here doesn't increase because it's always being metabolized. That means the, the change is uh, what comes in, which is K3 times CE minus the amount that is metabolized and that is zero. So this thing is what oh, this thing is what is being metabolized. So that means that the glucose uh, metabolization equals uh, K3 times CE. And then if you solve this equation, which is very simple, right? Because of that zero here, then you can compute CE as a function of CP. And we have replaced this CE with that CP. So we have this K1 divided by K2 plus K3. That gives this, gives this expression, all right? Now you will notice that I've been putting uh, uh, primes here everywhere. And the reason is that this is for glucose. And I will use also tracer uh, cons uh, concentrations and, and K values for FDG. Those will be without the, the prime. All right. And this thing is um, <clears throat> often called the, the yeah, it's, it's called a macro parameter because it's a combination of these micro parameters. And the experience is that this thing is typically more stable than the individual. Uh, estimates of the K values because there are strong correlations between those. But by combining them like this, uh, these correlations counteract each other. So th this can be pretty accurately estimated. And this thing pops up all the time, which is why it has been given a name, which is this R. And so what you have to do is to compute R and multiply it with the tracer concentration, uh, with the glucose concentration in the blood. And then you have the metabolism. Okay. So now, how do we get that R? And for that, we're going to use FDG. And so here is FDG. And here, the situation is very different because we cannot claim that the FDG concentration in the blood is constant because we, we inject it and then immediately we start scanning. So initially, it's zero and then it goes up. Well, we have seen the input functions definitely not constant. And same here, because this is not constant, these will be zero initially and they will obviously go up. So they will change over time. So we have the same differential equation as before, but we cannot say it's equal to um, zero. And then here, K4 is really zero. So in contrast to glucose, this FDG will enter into the cells, get phosphorylated, which is the first step that is also applied to glucose. And then somehow the chemistry in the cells notices that this is not glucose, but FDG. And then that chemistry says, oh, I, I cannot do anything with it. And it just hangs around in the cell and accumulates there, which is actually not very good. So if you give large concentrations of FDG, that, that is not a healthy thing. But for us, it's cool because it accumulates. And recall, this is a tracer concentration. So although this molecule looks like glucose and competes with glucose for entering the cell, it has no effect at all on what happens to glucose because the concentrations are like picomole or maybe nanomole, way below the glucose concentration in the blood. So for every FDG molecule, there will be many thousands or billions of glucose molecules. So the effect of FDG on the glucose metabolism is zero. And that is important for a tracer. The, if the tracer start changes what you measure, then yeah, your measurement is not pure anymore. Now we need to solve these differential equations. And so the, the way I would do that is by using the Laplace transform. It's a bit like a Fourier transform, but it's asymmetrical. So it, it's causal. It tells you what is going to happen in the future after something happens, and which is why it's not symmetrical. It integrates from now to the future and not like the Fourier transform from minus infinity to infinity. And then there is this wonderful S here, which can be a complex number, but it doesn't have to be. So it, it, it is in a way richer than Fourier transform, because in Fourier transform, we would always put uh, well, a real value times i. This thing can be both ways. But anyway, it's very useful to solve differential equations. And here you see basically all you need to solve the equations are typically 
pop-up in kinetic modeling. But of course, there is other ways to, to solve these same equations too. You can, you can first solve the homogeneous equation and then uh, send that to the non-homogeneous one too. All right, so if you do that exercise, then you will get this result. Yeah, and I, I explain in detail in the course how to do that. So if you're not 100% sure, you're still in control of the Laplace transform, then you can have a look there to figure out how to obtain this, uh, this result. And so recall again, we, this one we measure separately and then we measure only the sum of these because this total region is just what happens in a very, very small volume containing a few cells. And then the result of these equations looks like that. And it looks a bit tricky, but it's actually pretty easy to understand. So one term is this term. <coughs> um, and that one just integrates the input function. And so basically it represents this blue arrow. It, be, it says that there is part of the tracer that uh, gets in there and never gets out again. So it continuously increases. And that is also plotted here. So suppose we have a very artificial input function, which is zero, and then it once pops up, uh, stays constant, and then becomes zero again. Then the blue arrow would respond like this. It would just start accumulating because as long as there is tracer concentration offered, that part of it will go to the metabolic compartment in the end. And then as soon as you stop the, the supply, this thing will remain constant. And then there is another part of the tracer, which goes in here, hangs around a bit in CE, and then follows K2 back to the blood and vanishes. So this acts like a delay line, and that is a green thing. And so as soon as there is tracer offered here, um, tracer will come in, and a fraction of the tracer will get out again. But in the beginning, of course, more comes in than gets out. So this thing increases. And the concentration is here so high that what leaves equals what comes in. Then it you get a plateau. And then as soon as there is no longer an input function, the whole thing empties uh, exponentially. And that delay line is uh, obtained by convolving the input function with this mono exponential function, the decaying exponential. So like this, it looks pretty easy to understand, but if you have a very complicated input function, then of course, the, the, you cannot nicely separate these two behavior anymore. <clears throat> All right, so um, the blue arrow is not the concentration here, oh, and the green arrow is not the concentration here. And the reason is that part of the tracer that sits here is actually still going to follow K3 and end up there. So if you check, you, you can also compute what the, is the immediate trace concentration here and here. They're not these two terms. But the total is the same as, as this. All right, so now we're in the following situation. Um, we can, yeah, so we, we can now compute for every input function. Um, and given the K values, we can compute what to expect. So now we go back to our traditional problem. Somebody gives us the input function, gives us this uh, measured bet function. And then we have to determine K, the K values and we do that by fitting them. So. It's a maximum likelihood problem, basically, but usually one assumes uh, Gaussian uniform Gaussian distribution, so then becomes a least squares or a weighted least squares uh, fitting. So you fit until the calculated curve, which is the red thing here, is as close as you can get to the uh, measured values. And then we hope that that is the correct solution. And then we have the K values, but now we have the K values for um, FD, for FDG. And they are not the K values for glucose, so we're a bit stuck here. But unfortunately, biologists have been looking at it, and after a lot of thought, they have said, well, this R value is actually, or the ratio of the two R values is a constant. And they call it lumped constant because in their reasoning, it was the product of a lot of constants, and they just combine them, which is lump is thrown together, I think. And so the whole thing is constant, and this constant basically says um, divides the R of glucose by the R of FDG. And it's basically the difference in affinity. So this, if this glucose um, 
Uh, so this is the R of FDG, this is the R of glucose. And so the lumen constant is typically smaller than one, which means that the tissue actually can see the difference to some extent between glucose and FDG, and it prefers glucose. And so the lumen constant is like 0.6 or something, meaning that for every 10 glucose molecules entering the cell, uh, if you would offer the same amount, if you offer uh, yeah, the same amounts, and for every 10 glucose, only six FDGs would uh, get it. We offer very different amounts. All right, and because this is a constant, and because that constant can be determined from experiments, we can compute the glucose consumption by computing R, which is these K values, and we obtain them by fitting to the FDG curve, divide them by the constant to divide convert this R to the R prime, and then we have to multiply it with the glucose consumption. All right, so suppose I have two patients that happen to be totally identical for PET. So in patient one, we measure this and that, and in patient two, we measure exactly the same thing, a miracle. But we measure the glucose in the blood of both patients, and in patient two, the glucose is much higher which of the two has the highest glucose metabolism, or is it the same? So one way to remember it is to see that it's in the numerator. So if the glucose is twice as high, then for the same K values, we get twice the, the amount of glucose metabolism, right? But how to understand it? <clears throat> so what, one way to, that I find useful is to think, so there is an FDG, molecule <coughs> coming here and it manages to get accumulated in both patients. For in patient two, which has much more glucose in his blood, this is a much more wonderful achievement of that glucose metabolism because that glucose metabolism is competing against a lot more, sorry, that FDG molecule is competing against a lot more glucose. So the chance of that uh, FDG molecule to make it through here is much smaller because the, there is a, yeah, a lot of glucose that wants to do the same thing and then the cells even prefer that glucose. So that means if in such a patient who has much more glucose in his blood, we manage to get the same amount of tracer in the tissue that actually the amount of glucose entering up here must be much larger. But it, it's good to think it over a few times because yeah, the, the competition reasoning, then you quickly make a mistake and you conclude uh, more, FD, more glucose means less FDG. So I see that that error is often made. Then this is just to show that in practice, it, it's always a bit more difficult than you would have guessed. And so here is an example of uh, an acetate scan. And in, in this particular patients, they also did uh, a stress test, meaning that the well, what you could do, or, or what is possible, is that you have a, a partial stenosis in, in a, one of your arteries in, in the heart. And then if you're at rest, the opening in that artery is still large enough so that you get enough blood to your heart and everything looks fine. So the heart gets enough oxygen, gets enough uh, of everything it needs. And if you do an LDG scan, it looks just nicely uniform, the, the glucose metabolism or is the same everywhere. And perfusion is okay too. But then if the patient runs, that is no longer true because if you run, your heart needs more blood and all the arteries will open, but the one with the stenosis cannot do that. So part of your heart gets just the same as when you're at rest and everything, the other parts in the heart get more. And so that, that perfusion, that rest perfusion may not be enough. And so then, then that heart has a problem. So the problem is if the, if the cardiologists want to see that and they just do a scan at rest, they may actually miss it. So depending on the indication, they also might to want to do a scan at stress. And one way to do that is to ask the patient to bike and then immediately do a PET scan or even better to do the biking during the PET scan, but that's practically very difficult. And then very, yeah, there are many patients that are old or have other problems in addition to the cardiac uh, problem, which makes it difficult or impossible for them to do the biking. And then they give the peridamol or something similar, which uh, 
you can inject and it, it stresses the heart by uh, calling dilation of the blood vessels. So if, if your blood vessels get bigger, the heart has more work to do and uh, it, you stress the heart in a similar way. And if the heart has uh, stenosis, it will, you will again see it during the stress test. So your perfusion goes up during that stress test. And so that's been done in these patients. And then you see that when we do the acetate scan, you see that the heart is going up. So this thing is yeah, uh, maximum intensity projection, this one too, of the heart. Uh, and here you see the right ventricle, this is the, the left ventricle. And you see that the heart is going up. And that's called, well, depending on, on the, uh, the thing you do, on, on the, the chemical you inject, for the stress, this goes faster and lower. And this was done, I think, with adenosine, which has a shorter half-life. So as soon as you stop the adenosine in injection, the stress of the heart goes down. And apparently, if the heart gets stressed for some reason, it goes lower in your thorax. And then if you stop the stress, the, the stress it goes up again. And that's been called upward cre, which has been often been observed in stress tests. So the heart goes back to its rest position, which is a bit higher in the thorax. But for tracer kinetic modeling, that is inconvenient because we are going to draw regions in these volumetric images. And then uh, after a few frames later, these regions are no longer valid because the, the heart moved out of our region and the region that was in the, in the wall ends up in the blood pool, which is not what we want. So we have to do corrections for that. And so we implemented a program where you can indicate the heart and the program tries to put the heart back in the original position such that your regions are, uh, are valid again, or at least more valid than they would have been otherwise. Okay, and if everything works fine, then we are in a situation that we can apply the kinetic modeling. So we will have the input function, which comes, sorry, we have the input function, which comes here from that region. And then we can make the polar maps as before. Then we don't have to bother with three-dimensional regions. So we, we flatten the heart and we see out of the left ventricle. And then we can draw little regions here, or we can draw manual regions there, and then do kinetic modeling there. So the input function is the same for the entire left ventricle. But the tissue response is, of course, locally different. And as you can see here, there is an, an uh, infarction, which is due to stenosis. Uh, somewhere in the left anterior descent. Okay, and if, for such a region, we have the, the tracer uptake, which in this case, ammonia, and we can determine the absolute flow, which you see here. So it says that in the, that the flow is about 0.3 milliliter uh, bl uh, blood per milliliter tissue and per minute. And this is similar for acetate, uh, but here we like to have an image. So the problem with acetate is that in contrast to FDG or ammonia, you never have a nice static image. So at, at, if you do a dynamic ammonia scan, then the last image, the last frame is an image of accumulated ammonia. So even if the dynamics fail, you still have a very diagnostically valuable image at the end. And same for FDG but not for acetate, because at the end you have nothing left, the acetate will wash out again. And in addition, from acetate, we want to have perfusion and oxidative metabolism, but it's not true that the first frames are perfusion and the last frames are metabolism. Both are affecting the entire curve. And so here we do the curve fitting on a pixel by pixel basis. And again, there are a lot of papers on, on how to do that. Uh, and what I did here is a paper by Blomquist, which is from the 80s, I think, uh, which is doing it analytically, so you don't need to do it iteratively. And you see that these days you get excellent curves. I actually did that in the 90s with 2D PET systems, which much poorer sensitivity, and I really struggled to get decent curves out of it. So it's very tricky. You need to do smoothing and all kinds of tricks to make it work. And these days, if you apply it, so I applied this a long time after I applied it in the past. It was very impressive how, how good it works these days. Uh, 